Hello everybody, what is going on? Today we're going to be doing a little overview slash review of the PlayStation Backbone here for specifically the iPhone. Now before we get into that, a couple things with this device I wanted to mention. Number one, this is made, or was made I should say, for older versions of iPhone. So I think about, I think this originally came out when the iPhone 12 and 12 Pro and whatnot came out. So if you actually want to use this on a 13 or a 14 or Pro, etc., it comes with this little rubber adapter thing here. And so let's take that off for a second and see actually what this looks like. Here we have a 14 Pro Max, the uh, purple if that matters to you. And you see the lightning connector we have here, so we know it's for iPhone. Now we try to finagle this in here. You see we get it in there. But the screen, you see it's not flat there, and that's because of the, oh, you see it just falls apart right there like that. That's because of the cameras, the camera bump there. So let's pull that back out, and you see it's not quite even because of the cameras kind of hitting the plastic back part here. So we have to take the phone out, put this little rubber adapter back in there, I'll see if I can remember how it went like that. Now this is a, probably my biggest complaint with this device is this thing. Because this has been out for a couple of years already, and they haven't updated it or refreshed it. They just pack this little rubberized piece into the top of the box. So we'll see now that it fits properly, as in there's something actually holding the phone. But you look at the back and it's still like, it's not even right, because it has to pop the phone up a little bit. I'm not super concerned about it aesthetically because you're looking at it front on, it's no problem. Look at it from behind, it's, it's a little annoying, but I'm more concerned about is it bad to have the phone with a lightning charger in it at an angle like that for prolonged periods of time. Now I don't know the answer to that. I've used this about a week and I haven't had any issues with it but your results may vary. So with that little uh, kind of update on my purchase, my experience with it, let's get into the full review. Now, if you're buying a device like this, you're buying it for basically one of kind of two or three things. Obviously, since it is PlayStation branded, you're probably expecting, or at least are expected by the company, to use the PlayStation Remote Play app to stream games from your PlayStation 4 or PS5 to the device itself. Um, of course, there are many other uses. You can even use it for like the Game Pass apps or streaming from your Xbox or other things. Of course, the Apple Arcade games or any game you have on iOS or even an emulator you might have on a device that supports controller input. So for example, let's pop into Dead Cells right here. This is on Apple Arcade. Launch it, boot it up here real quick. And I, every game I've tried on Apple Arcade that supports controllers, it just kind of naturally does it after all. You'll see when you get into a game at first, sometimes it doesn't recognize it, but you just tap the screen a couple times and it's like, oh, okay, there's a controller there. And boom, you're right into it, recognizes every button, there's no issues. So this is one of my favorite kind of roguelike games, so to be able to play this without having to stream it and with a controller, and without having to like get an attachment or some kind of weird concoction, I just patch it at the phone, get going in the game, no issues. It's really, really nice. And it's very fluid too. Obviously running on an iPhone, <laughs> iPhone 14 Pro Max here. So performance with a game like this is gonna be no issue. We've got everything maxed out, highest frame rate, highest settings, all that fun stuff. So the controller is not gonna be the deciding factor in how the game performs but it's so much nicer on a controller. So let's exit Dead Cells here. And let's go on over to the Remote Play app. I believe I have it here somewhere. There we are, Remote Play. Connect it to the PS5. You have to set this up at first, but after you set it up the first time, it will just turn your PS5 on and connect to it if you are on the same network. And I believe you can connect to it as well from other networks, but it's a little bit more of a hassle, and I would say, in terms of the connection quality, it's really not going to be worth it unless you're playing something extremely 
turn-based. All right, we're booting up here. We got the volume. Now I was actually, I've used remote play before. I was surprised by remote play very recently. I don't know if they've updated it or what, but it feels much better than it used to. And it definitely prioritizes kind of stability over anything else. So when I tested this, I tested out Black Ops Cold War, Spyro, and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles here, Shredder's Revenge. Now, I'll pop into some of these games, but I'm going to just talk about them generally. This game, because of its uh, nature, I thought this ran really well, and you could almost not tell that there was any kind of delay, just because of the nature of this game. It's not necessarily a quick input uh, type of game. So, let's just get into it real quick. You can, if you want, you know, watch my hands compared to what's going on on the screen. To me, at least, in this game, it does not feel like there's much delay. Let's skip past all these and just get into gameplay. See, it looks pretty clear, no issues there. I have to remember how to play this game, so. But if there is delay in this, it's ever so slight. And with the nature of the game, like how meaty the hits are and how long it takes to go for your next hit or next button press, I would, I would be confident in saying I could play this entire game, no issues, uh, streaming it from my PlayStation using the backbone here. So with that, Let's leave that one there. I think we have to tap on the screen here to bring the PlayStation button up. That is my other biggest complaint about this uh, device is beyond the first thing I said about the adapter here, which is it's an annoyance for how much you're spending on this. If you don't know, this is a basically a hundred dollar device. I don't know how much it goes on sale. I'm sure if you try to get it used, you can probably get it for maybe around 80, 80 to 90. Um, but this is a hundred dollars. And the fact that it doesn't fit the newest, most expensive phones, it has to have a weird kind of like rubber adapter, it's not ideal. But the second thing is, first of all, the kind of start select type buttons are not where they are on PlayStation. So I would have been fine if these buttons and the sticks were moved down and the start and select were moved to up here. That would feel way more natural. And the other biggest issue is their proprietary app. You do not need it. But if you hit these buttons, either the backbone button here that brings up their app, or I believe the share, like to, to take a screenshot, it takes you out of your game, out of whatever you're doing into their software. And the biggest issue with that, especially with something like remote play, which need I remind you this device is made for, you have to reconnect to the PlayStation. So that's a bit of a problem. Is it the end of the world? Absolutely not. but. It is certainly not ideal. Now the next game I tested uh, was the Spiral Reignited Trilogy here. And this one I definitely had noticeable delay. I wouldn't say any like lag or slowdown, maybe one or two hitches here and there where I could, you know, very clearly see it wasn't as good as it would be natively. But overall, once factoring in that kind of delay, uh, it was 100% playable. So let's take a look here. There definitely is a delay to it, but it also helps this game, maybe more than others, that this game, even with its updated controls, still controls kind of tanky. Like, it's not super easy to turn around. You kind of turn around in a circle. It's not like, uh, you know, maybe like The Witcher 3, where you're just instantly facing the other direction the second you press back. Um, so it is kind of tanky by nature, and they kind of kept that from the original, which uh, I like. But because of that, I think the kind of slight delay added on top of that isn't as annoying as it might be for some other games that I have tried, like Call of Duty. Now, I don't think we're going to launch that up and try a multiplayer match, but when I played that, it was, for the first maybe half, I only played one multiplayer round with the backbone so far. But the first half of it was 
so pixelated. I swear there may be 500 pixels on the entire screen. But about halfway through the match, it fixed and it was just as clear as this is. I don't know why. Um, it felt just as smooth the whole way, but the, the bit rate or whatever was going on there just was not up to par. Now, at least for me, you're not getting a device like the Backbone here to play multiplayer games from your PlayStation, from your Xbox, streaming from your PC, uh, on the go or in your bed. It's The technology is just not there yet. And plus, a screen this size, you're not going to be able to see the enemies. Like the, For example, the PlayStation, the streaming app, the PS Remote Play, it maxes out at 720p. Now that's totally fine for a screen this size. But the more resolution, the better when you're playing multiplayer games because it is difficult on a small screen and a low resolution to see enemies. Basically impossible. You're not going to have a very good time. Which is why we see games like mobile versions of things, like the mobile version of Apex Legends, Fortnite, etc. have really designed their graphics in such a way that things are much more visible much more clear enemies are. When you're running the console or the PC version of that game, you, you're at a severe disadvantage. So with these kind of three games I've tested, I've tested a few others, um, some of the Castlevania games, the older ones, the kind of remastered collections to see how old games like that that really need precise button input matched, and it was, it was fine, it was no issue. Again, is it the best way to play it? No. But if you want to kind of lounge around in bed for an hour, hour and a half before you go to bed and just play something chill like Spyro here, it's actually pretty awesome. I was surprised by that because in the past when I've tried the PlayStation app, it has not been good. So that is really my experience with this device. It's not a review of the unit itself, but just the, the functionality, the use of this device. If you are using it, um, whether it's the iPhone version or not, you can actually charge it through the controller while you're playing, which is nice. And it's USB-C, so you don't need an extra lightning port cable if you only have one. And it does have a headphone jack as well, so the sound can route through it, which is nice. Overall, I don't think this device is worth its asking price. There's a lot of competition now. There's uh, the Razer Kishi V2, there's the GameSir. They're all kind of in the similar price range, but once the newest version comes out, the previous one drops in price pretty significantly or goes on sale. I would say if you have the 100 bucks to drop and you know you want to play some chill games like this in, in their bed or, you know, waiting on the couch while you're waiting for a family member to go somewhere, it's great for little sessions like that or playing like we showed some of those games on the go, like Dead Cells, like other games that will use that. Uh, maybe like Sonic Racing or something there, Stardew Valley, which just came out on Apple Arcade. I'm really looking forward to trying that on this thing. But that's kind of where its use case ends. You're not going to be playing anything competitive on here. And if you are, people using touch controls who are familiar with that, who prefer that over regular controls, are going to wipe the floor with you. So it's really not worth playing even the mobile games competitively. But for streaming, especially for single-player games, for turn-based games... This thing is awesome, it's great. All the buttons feel very good. I would say the triggers are a little lacking. The D-pad feels good though, all the buttons feel good. These are very PS Vita style buttons. The sticks feel good. We got L3, R3, we got the start and select. The only annoyance is to repeat what I mentioned here before we close out are the removal from the top of the controller where the start and select buttons are the annoying backbone buttons that bring you to the app and close out whatever you're doing, and then also the weird kind of rubber adapter that makes your phone kind of off-kilter, which worries me a little bit for a, uh, a greater than $1,000 phone having the charging port at an angle like that. But beyond that, I think this device is really good. I think it's, for some people, worth the asking price, and for a lot of people, once they research it, will realize it's really not something for them, something they want or need but it is cool to have. So that is my review, my discussion, my thoughts on the PlayStation Backbone for iOS. Obviously, it's going to be the same for Android, whether it's the PlayStation-themed version or the Xbox-themed version. It's going to be the exact same thing. So 
Let me know in the comments what you guys think if you have this device or similar, and how much you actually use it if you do have it. Till next time, have a great one.